In the previous annotated PowerPoint, we looked at the three major types of synovial joints, the ball and socket, the hinge, and the pivot. Now let's zoom in on each one and start talking about them up close and personal. So the ball and socket we say is a multi-axial joint, allowing movement in all three axes. So we live in a universe that has three spatial dimensions. Things can have a height, a width, and a length. You can call them other names, but there are three spatial dimensions. The ball and socket joint can move in all three of those spatial dimensions. So it is an incredibly useful joint, incredibly versatile, versatile and it has a huge range of motion. It allows flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, circumduction, and rotation. This is the most useful joint by far. But remember, it's the least stable. That's why the glenohumeral joint is the most commonly dislocated joint. At the shoulder, the head of the humerus fits into the glenoid cavity. That's why we call it glenohumeral. Commonly dislocated because of the shallow glenoid fossa. So remember that glenoid uh, cavity or glenoid fossa was very, very shallow. Um, so it's easy for the head to slip out of there. At the hip, the head of the femur fits into the acetabulum of the hip bone. It's called the acetabulofemoral joint. And yes, you now have to know the technical names of joints. They're easy though, because we learn, already learn those parts on the bone. You don't dislocate your hip nearly as often because the acetabulum is very deep whereas that glenoid cavity was very shallow. Acetabulum is deep. Plus, look in the uh, upper, in the left-hand side, the lower left and the upper right on the left, um, you can see there are big, thick ligaments that tie that hip joint together. So dislocated hips are not all that common, but they do occur. I remember several years back, one of the Arizona Diamondbacks, it was a weird thing. He was like returning to, um, you know, somebody like hit a foul ball and he'd taken off running. And he was returning to second base, I think it was second base, and he went to step on the bag and he just did it in an awkward way and he ended up dislocating his hip. And he was out for, I don't know, a couple of months at least. So it does happen, but not very often. So remember at the very beginning of these annotated PowerPoints on the joints, I said that you know we were not be, going to be talking about a joint as in a marijuana joint. Uh, but that right there, that's quite a joint. Um, but uh, I wanted to go back and mention just a couple things about marijuana because it is a widespread drug. Um, it's not up to me to tell you what to do. I mean, now here in Arizona, we have uh, marijuana dispensaries. You can get your card and you can go get it. So it's a personal decision. I'm not going to say it's good or bad. Um, but there are a couple of things to think about here. Marijuana, proud sponsors of... Um, we forget. So... Uh, before I go on to gynecomastia, there is actually now a lot of research. You know, back in the 60s was when all the hippies started smoking marijuana, you know, big time. And um, there has now been, you know, I mean, that's, you know, 60 years ago now. Um, so there have been, uh, there's been an opportunity to do some long-term longitudinal studies on the effects of marijuana. And there does seem to be one that shows up again and again. It's not just make it up. It, it looks like there's actual data on this. Um, People who are heavy users of marijuana, anyway, often end up with some short-term memory difficulties. Um, you know, they kind of like forget what they're talking about in the middle of a sentence. I mean, a lot of people do that anyway, like me. Um, uh, but uh, heavy marijuana users can do it even more. So that's something to take into account. And another possibility here, I mean, this is controversial. There's some evidence for it and other people say no, but it may cause gynecomastia, especially in pubescent males who do a lot of marijuana smoking. Um, puberty is a time when there are lots of hormone things happening in your body and marijuana, uh, it, it binds to receptors called anandamide receptors, which ultimately, anand uh, well, I'm not going to go into all the details. We'll, we may talk about that later. But um, they come from arachidonic acid, and yeah, there's hormone uh, possibilities there, hormone connections, all right? So what's gynecomastia? Man boobs. So, you know, if you've got a 14-year-old cousin, a uh, boy, and he's really smoking a lot of marijuana, maybe that will get him to stop. You know, it might be worth a try. Because seriously, whether you think marijuana is good or bad, it's not good to use before you reach the end of puberty. It's not good to use until you're an adult. It really can mess with development during puberty. And we will never talk about man boobs again. That's a disgusting topic. <clears throat> yeah. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, there you go. Got your sidewinders, your old man droopers, your D covers, your woolly memories, your lopsiders, you frightened freckles, your vampire bites, your homers. Yeah, uh, mud flaps. Okay, no, never again. Okay, let's move on to the hinge joint. Hinge joint, a monoaxial joint. It moves in only one plane. Remember, the ball and socket joint was multiaxial. Monoaxial, it only does an opening and closing type of movement. The convex surface of one bone fits into the concave of another. So, like your elbow joint and your knee joint. So, now again, we're going to have to learn the technical names. Your knee joint is your tibiofemoral joint. That's easy. It's where your tibia and your femur come together. Elbow is your humeral ulnar joint. Once again, how easy can it be? It's where the humerus and the ulna come together. And then the ankle joint is called the talocrural joint, and that's when it kind of breaks the rule a little bit, but remember the talus is the bone of the ankle. And then what was the name for the part of your tibia that was your shin, the region of your body that's your shin? That's your crural region. So talocrural really does make sense. That's easy, all right? And also your interphalangeal joints, you know, the, in the proximal, middle, and distal phalanges, where they link together those two joints. We have the proximal interphalangeal joint and the distal interphalangeal joint. Those are both hinge joints. Oops, I talked over the transition. I don't know if that came through. They're hinge joints. Uh, hinge joint, uh, the knee in particular here, is the most complex joint in the body, and it's the bane of all athletes. I mean, oh my gosh, football players, baseball players, volleyball players, soccer players, man, that knee. The thing of it is, the knee is really stable from front to back. It's from side to side that the knee is very instable, and that's usually how the trouble comes about. So there are two intracapsular ligaments, the anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL, and the posterior cruciate ligament. Crucia basically means shaped like a cross, and the reason they're called that is because they form a cross inside. If you look in the upper left-hand illustration, you can see the two ligaments cross each other, the PCL and the ACL. Um, cruciate means shaped like a cross. Those are the two intracapsular ligaments, and then there are two extracapsular ligaments. The medial or tibial collateral ligament, often abbreviated just as the MCL, and the lateral or fibular collateral ligament, the LCL. This is a good time to remind you, by the way, always remember that in your lower leg, the tibia is on the medial side of your lower leg, and the fibula is on the lateral side of your lower leg. So that's why you can call it either medial or tibial, and why you can call it either lateral or fibular. Now, the knee also has the menisci, singular meniscus. If you look in the upper left, you can see those big blue horseshoe-shaped pads. Um, those are the menisci. And then the patella, the kneecap, is stabilized by the quadriceps tendon from above and by the patellar ligament from below. And by patellar retinaculi, which are little chunks of connective tissue on the side. I probably won't talk about those very much, but take a look and make sure you get this straight. Even though people call the whole thing often just the patellar ligament, that's really not technically correct. Look on the top. That's actually the quadriceps muscle. It's rectus femoris. That's the tendon that's grabbing a hold of the patella. Therefore, that is the quadriceps tendon. Whereas on the bottom, it's the patella being connected to the tibia. That's bone to bone, so that's a ligament. So the top part, it's really one giant chunk of connective tissue, but technically the top part is a tendon and the bottom part is a ligament. The ACL, the MCL, and the meniscus together are sometimes called the unhappy triad because they often all three go together. So most serious knee injuries result from a lateral blow to the knee. So you see like a hockey puck hitting the knee from the side. Oftentimes in sports too, that's what happens. Think football baseball. People are sliding into you from the side. Now notice what happens when you get, the knee gets hit from the side. It causes the outside of the leg to sort of buckle, all right, and that actually puts some slack into that side. To the ligaments on that side, that actually puts some slack in. But look what happens to the ligaments on the medial side. Those get overstretched. That's why 
and impact to the lateral side of the knee causes damage to the connective tissue on the medial side. Do you see that? Stop and think about that for a moment. Notice how the two bones, the femur and the uh, tibia, see they're bending towards each other on the outside, so therefore the ligaments get more slack. But they're bending away from each other on the medial side, and that's why those things get stressed. And of course in sports, you often have people running around outside of your body. You normally don't have people running around in between your legs. So that's why the lateral blows are much more likely, much more common causes of injury in sports than blows from the medial side of the knee. So the ACL and the MCL are the most commonly injured ligaments. And then the meniscus, um, so what happens is the medial meniscus is also attached to the medial collateral ligament. So when the ligament tears, it pulls a chunk of the meniscus with it. And that's what you get. All three together end up getting damaged. So it's estimated that roughly 50% of professional football players will have a serious knee injury during their careers. Um, and the repair is often done by arthroscopic surgery. They w didn't have the ability to do this in the old days. I remember seeing um, friends of mine who'd blown out their knees and they had these big giant scars. Now, no longer. They just make two tiny little incisions. One is basically just to shine a light in there so they can see what they're doing. And then the other one just has basically some snippers and some needle and some thread and stuff like that. They go in and they snip away the cartilage and if necessary they sew up the, the ligament. So that's why now just tiny little scars. And I'm sure some of you have done that. Normally if we were in the classroom I would have all the people who'd blown their knee out. They raise their hand and we all get to go look at their scars and we go, ooh, ah, it's fun. It let's people be celebrities for a day. So the three C's of the knee, the three C's of the knee. You got your collateral ligaments, you got your cruciate ligaments, and you got your cartilages or your menisci. So there you go. Those are the ones that get damaged. Now I'm going to warn you if you're squeamish, don't look, and I, I'll try to remind you when I'm off of this slide. But I want to show you someone who has a knee injury. Okay, there you go. A couple of football players. So look at the player on the left wearing the orange jersey. Now orient yourself a little bit. Notice his right leg. You can see his right thigh and then the lower part of his right leg. And then on his left leg you see his left thigh and the lower part of his left leg is going completely the wrong direction. That is a complete dislocation of the tibiofemoral joint. You can see the x-ray in the upper right hand corner. Notice the tibia and the femur have completely separated. And see that little white thing like floating kind of on the upper right? That's the patella. It's basically just dangling there at this point. So that's a very serious injury. I am I can guarantee you that that guy didn't play football anymore after that. Um, you're, you're gonna, I think, walk with a limp the rest of your life. And look at the terrible thing about it. They're both on the same team. I think it's the University of Texas or maybe Tennessee, I don't know. But uh, it happened during practice. Oh my God. At least you want to have it during a game so you got a story about it. Okay, so looking at the last kind of joint then, the pivot joint. Um, pivot joint is a monoaxial joint again. It only moves in one direction and that is that it rotates around its own longitudinal axis. Longitudinal means the length of the bone. So um, it, that bone rotates and therefore the jo joint rotates. So the rounded surface of one bone articulates with a ring of bone and a ligament. So the easy one we've already talked about is the atlantoaxial joint. That's how you shake your head no. So the, um, you can see in the lower left, atlas is literally spinning around axis. That's shaking your head no. The radial ulnar joint, that's what you use to pronate and supinate. That's where the radius rotates around the ulna. So when the palm moves anteriorly, that's supination. Palm moves posteriorly, that's pronation. That's what the radial ulnar joint allows you to do, is to supinate and pronate, which is incredibly useful. I mean, it allows you to rotate the entire end of your arm. It's so very versatile, so you can grab things from many different directions. By the way, that's the way you throw a curveball when you're teaching little kids. I, I play a lot of baseball. That's what I'd be doing right now. Well, no, I'd be retired, obviously. I'd be a retired professional baseball player if my dreams had worked out. 
I made it, you know, I played baseball all the way into college, and I had a tryout with the Cleveland Indians. They said that, you know, I looked pretty good. I was a pitcher. They said uh, they were a little concerned my, about my velocity. Had great breaking stuff. Oh, God, I had a slider. I also had a screwball, um, what they call now a cut fastball. Um, but they were a little concerned. I was only throwing like in the mid-80s. Greg Maddox only threw in the mid-80s. He's in the Hall of Fame, but um, they were concerned. They told me to go play like in the Mexican leagues or in the Dominican leagues and then maybe come back and see me in another year. And I thought, oh, God, that's the end. Better get the Ph.D. I'm not going to be able to play ball. So, um, and uh, there you see, um, that's, uh, that's uh, from the movie um, Groundhog Day. Um, that's there you see the Alanto axial joint in operation but if we were in the classroom I always carry a baseball in my uh, backpack just to remind myself of what a complete failure I am in life but I normally take the baseball out and I like throw it up into the air and I show you how easy it is just what happens is when you throw a baseball normally you flex your wrist and that gives the baseball um, a backward spin if you supinate as you flex your wrist it gives the baseball a sideways spin and then it curves. It's so easy. I could teach any kid how to throw a curveball. Nothing to it. Okay, and there are a few other kinds of joints that I'm not going to emphasize at all. Um, there's these joints, all right, the planar joint, the saddle joint, the condyloid joint. I'm just showing you that we didn't cover 100% of everything. I'm not making you learn every single damn thing in the world. We're only covering the main topics here. So, but there you see a couple more possibilities, and that kind of joint we definitely did not cover. Yes, all right, game over. Pick this up again in the next annotated PowerPoint.